Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin O'Connell. You're the founder of the Niche Movement. I'll be hosting tonight's broadcast with our May edition of Niche Story, featuring our very own contributing editor, who's been writing for us for just about a month, or two months, I'm sorry, Emma Marfo. Uh, we use this series as a chance to interview those who have found their niche, love what they're doing, and just really want to share advice to inspire others. And tonight, I think Emma's going to hit the nail on the head here with our topic of standing out as an introvert. Uh, Emma has a new book out that we'll talk about. Uh, she's also written some great blog posts, and I have a few experts, uh, experts from that that we're going to bring up tonight, and uh, we'll go from there. But before I turn it to Emma, uh, I'll give her a quick introduction. Currently, she's the Assistant Director of Student Activities for Involvement and Assessment at Emmanuel College up in Boston, Mass. Uh, she values a lot of what the niche movement is about and what I believe, uh, specifically finding a career path that suits students' skills and talents, uh, and really going off of the whole, how can we help students avoid employment and unhappiness and find their niche and, and a passion and, and love what they're doing. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Emma and get started here tonight. Thanks for coming on, Emma. Thank you for having me. Um, so as Kevin said, right now I am one of the assistant directors of student activities at Emanuel College in Boston, Massachusetts. So I work with student organizations as well as social media and web development for our office, commuter students, and uh, a lot of training and development. Um, so in addition to that, I do a lot of, as Kevin talked about, a lot of supplementary writing, and I'm really into finding other areas of interest besides just what it is you do on the day-to-day. -day. So I think part of finding a niche is being okay with your niche being in a couple different places and being able to kind of explore those things openly and based on what you're interested in, let that lead you on any number of paths at one time and being okay with that. Um, for me, I started doing a lot of introversion research when I was in graduate school at the University of South Florida and decided to look at it a little bit more as far as how it affected professionals as well as how it affected the students I work with. So in addition to learning how it fit me and how it kind of fit the kind of work I do and how I do it, also helping my students who are still trying to figure out how do I search for jobs that will fit me as an introvert or once I'm on the job how do I let people around me know how do I work in situations that are a little bit tougher so a lot of my time and energy has been spent towards helping people answer those questions. Great and so I'm curious you know you know, said you just wrote a book and everything you said it, take, it took 10 months to write it but what made you really get into you know introverts and studying them and finding out how that they actually can have an advantage of being introvert. What made you kind of start writing about that and looking into it? Well, one of my best friends in grad school is an extrovert, and he's an extreme extrovert. So realizing us being in the same environment and how differently we handled things, I, we got really interested together in figuring out what that looks like for different people and what that would look like for the students we were eventually going to work with. Um, we both have masters in education in curriculum instruction, but specifically with college students. So we were really interested to see how that would affect the populations we were going to work with. So we did a lot of research together. Working on projects with an extrovert was a whole other experience unto itself, and I'm sure there, if there aren't books about that already, he and I could probably write a pretty good one. Um, and seeing how students responded when we took it to conferences and were able to present it in a couple different scenarios made me think, at least for the introvert side, there's something here, and there's something that I want to explore a little bit more. So it started by being with somebody who very much was not that and seeing how differently we approach things. So you had you kind of being an introvert and your friend being super extroverted, would you mm -hmm. say that? Yes, he is super E, he's a capital E. <laughs> so he's a 10. He is, he's a 10. He's great. a 10, I'm about a two and a half, we'll say. Yeah. There's a great, there's a great video we'll have to share out uh, with Dan Pink. Uh, it was in his latest book on why, uh, it's, I forget the name of it, but it basically talks about the scale of 1 to 10 of introvert to a, uh, extrovert. In the middle, there's ambiverts and kind of like 4, 5, and 6s. And I talk about this a lot with students, uh, where it's actually pretty good to be somewhere 3, 4, 5, because sometimes being a 7, 8, 9, 10 could be you're almost too out there or you're, you're not listening enough. Uh, right. So there's nothing wrong with, with being an introvert, which we'll get into here tonight. Yeah, and I mean, everybody's on the scale, so... Everybody has a little bit of some. You might have a little bit of one and a lot of another, but we're all working on the same scale. So yeah. there's definitely parts of both in everybody. Yeah. And it comes and goes with energy level, I'm sure, and with who you're with and situations and kind of uh, whether you're nervous or, you know, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I, that's something what came across in your book when I read through it. 
Right. But I want to I want to hit this uh, before we get into the whole standing out part. But in one of Emma's first, I think it was one of your first blog posts with us a couple of months ago. It was uh, see what sticks. So she did a series of I think three or four blog posts of see what sticks, uh, and the title was getting naked with your job search. Mm-hmm. Compared it to a book. Uh, you compared it to a book that you're that you're reading. But the quote here, I'm going to read it uh, verbatim. Is so many of us have trouble uh, with with job searches because we find one job posting, quote unquote, fall in love with it and let our own uh, let our let our confidence and momentum shatter if we don't get offered the job. Then you kind of go on to say, don't let what we uh, don't let what we don't get bring us down. Uh, so if you could just expand on that, because I know so many college students see a job or go for an interview and they think, oh, I got this one in the bag, and they're so excited, and then they get super disappointed. So maybe they're expectations don't match the reality. Sure. Um, so for those who may not have read the post or aren't familiar with the book, Getting Naked is a book by Harlan Cohen that talks about having success in your love life. And it talks about these five different stages of getting yourself ready to be out there and prepared to be in a relationship. And the type of relationship that you would be in with a person in many ways mirrors the type of relationship you would have with a job. It's a big part of your life. There's a tremendous level of commitment there. There's a certain amount of fit that has to go to, for that relationship to work. And he talks very specifically about, in the first step of that, making it okay to not get any given person or any given opportunity. Kind of giving yourself permission and giving other people permission to not be into you or not be the one for you. So in the same way that you would be super involved with a job or really, really like a person, and if that falls through or doesn't work out for whatever reason, it hurts a little bit. And you kind of, you feel it, you definitely do, but then eventually you brush it off and you move forward. You don't always think you're going to be able to, but eventually you kind of get there. That heartbreak, so to speak, be it for a person or for a job, does eventually fade away and you get to move on and find other things that you like as much. So I think in the same way that you give at the beginning of that process permission for not every person to be in love with you, not every job is going to work out. You can't get every job you interview for, and you certainly can't do every job that you interview for. So having that in your mind from the beginning, saying, if this doesn't work out, I'm going to keep going, I'm going to keep moving on and keep looking. So making sure that that's something that you have in your heart and in your mind from the beginning is really, really helpful as you go into that process. So kind of to sum it up, don't get so attached to that one job and still kind of have your different options out there. Yep, yep. So let's let's jump into the book. Um, you said it was just published and released in January. Uh, it's titled The Eyes Have It, and yes. uh, I'm curious about where the title came from. I really love puns. I really like all forms of humor, be it super high, highbrow and intelligent, or super easy and accessible, and for me it was something that I kind of wanted, something catchy, but that also kind of said a little bit about what it was about. So in a lot of the research that I did, and even a lot of the times when I'm referring to people, it's eyes versus ease. So saying the eyes have it is kind of this empowering thing to say that even though introversion isn't necessarily the majority way of being or the dominant way of being, there's still something there. So I decided to make it cheesy. I stand by it. I'll stick with it. I love it. So uh, give, give a quick synopsis of what the book's about, and I know you kind of... Uh, have it broken down in various chapters about you know being an introvert in an interview situation to when you actually land a job to uh, whether you're on the management side or leadership side of introversion. Um, give us a quick snapshot of what it what's it, what it's about. Sure. So the subtitle of the book is Reflections on Introversion in Student Affairs, but I've given it to several people that aren't in student affairs and they found benefit in it regardless. So even though I come from that lens of looking at it for my work, it fits in a lot of different scenarios. So the book is split into two separate parts. Uh, The first part is demystifying it, so talking a little bit about what people think introversion means. Um, So some people think it's being shy, where in actuality, shyness and introversion are subtly different things. Shyness, in most forms of the research, means that there's some sort of fear or discomfort associated with yourself that's making you quiet. With introverts, it's not being afraid of people. A lot of introverts really like people, and it's not really... Um, disliking them either. None, very few of us hate people, and if so, that's not really a temperament-based thing. That's just who we are. Um, it's an energy type thing. So if you get more energy from being by yourself or thinking about things than you do from other people or talking about things, that's introversion. So there is a subtle difference between the two, and I talk a little bit about that. Um, and then the second half of the book talks about managing it. So if you are an introvert that's 
in a graduate program, or if you're an introvert that is going out in an interview or going to a conference for, uh, for work, how to manage the types of situations that challenge introverts and what kinds of strategies you can use to overcome them. So it's broken into those two parts, and then there's a bridge in the middle that talks a little bit about how we try to hide introversion, so acting extroverted, so to speak, so what that does when you kind of act in a way that's against your nature. So the book kind of addresses all of those things, but the majority of it is the managing piece. So it gives you strategies on how to be an introvert in situations where it's not necessarily easy or expected. Great. So over the, you said you've been working with uh, in student affairs for about six years, and mm -hmm. before we jumped on this live, you obviously have kind of taken this book and been able to adapt it to different settings, present on it, and things like that. But you also said you use a lot of these tools and, and your research to help your own students and some other students out there. So sure. let's jump into this as far as what the research you've done, what you wrote about, and what you present about. Mm -hmm. um, what are some some things out there for for college students and recent grads? And we could. I guess start with maybe the whole like getting into the real world part uh, before we even talk about the job searches. Is kind of how they adapt and, and have, what their expectations would be if they're an introvert. Sure. Um, so the transition from moving out of classes into the workforce is a tough one, really, for anybody that's doing it. But going into a workplace where people might not necessarily know how you work as well or you might be still trying to feel out how you work best, is definitely a challenging thing. So I talk in the book a little bit about um, going into things as prepared as possible. So maybe asking for information that you'll need in advance of a meeting. If you don't have an agenda a couple days in advance, being okay with asking for that, knowing that you need to have a little bit more information going in, um, is, is something that not everybody really thinks to do, but you'd be surprised how much it helps your energy level to not be on edge with that kind of uncertainty going into it. Um, similarly, I think being able to kind of know how you work. So if you're going to be in an open office type scenario, deciding is this going to be the kind of thing where I try to work from home a couple times or if I come in a little bit earlier to kind of value that quiet time and really figuring out in the very beginning how to gauge your energy, what the office energy is going to be like and how you can adapt to work in it the best you can. It's really difficult having an open office for people who like to have their quiet time, so that's something that I always recommend people take a little bit more time to figure out how's this going to work for me, how can I adapt to it. For my own part, I like to go to the office early because it's quiet so I can get things done before kind of people come in with their own requests. So finding those little quirk things that work for you to kind of help you manage your energy can be really helpful, especially at the beginning. I think it was a great jumping point as far as, because one of the things I was going to ask you was the whole work environment. What, sh you know, what should uh, people job searching be looking for? But I think you, you really said it in that they may not want to look at these uh, the startup culture, the up-and-coming companies that have that like wide open, no cubicle setting where there may no, you know, may not be that downtime or that, that time to kind of recharge the battery. So they may want to look for maybe a more traditional type of office or culture or things like where it might be a little bit more organized versus fast-paced and kind of, you know, they don't know what's coming next. Would you agree with that? I think it depends. I think that you can definitely look for things that give you a little bit more downtime or and I'm not above asking this in a question, when you go to see if the space you'll be working in, if it has a door or not, um, I'm really big on using the option of closing my door if I have the opportunity to do so. And it's a small thing, but it gives you that extra step of preparing yourself before being inundated with any number of things that might come at you. But even in a startup culture, even in open office areas, you also have the option of making deals with people you work with. So, for example, on some of my heavier weeks, I'll let my boss know on a Friday morning when no students are going to come to my office because no one gets up at 8 a.m. on a Friday, I can go to the library. And I have that couple hours where I can sit somewhere quiet and work. That's something that everybody in the office knows that I do, and it just gives me the opportunity to have some time carved out during the week that I know that I have for bigger projects or things that I need to concentrate a little bit harder on. And you can make those deals. So if your office doesn't have that, maybe going to Starbucks or working from home one morning a week. But being comfortable knowing that's what you need and then being comfortable asking for it. So there are definitely are ways around that. Yeah, I, I think that tip alone can help anybody watching this or that, that catches this is, you know, whether you're introverted, extroverted, different cultures, you know, whether you're you're just starting out in your career or, or not, I think you need that chunk, those chunks of time to schedule away and, and go work in a quiet place, whether you, know, like you said coffee shop or it's your home or you shut the door in your office. I think it's those tips are for anybody. 
Definitely. Um, so let's, you know, the main reason we, we connected here and, and wanted to do the interview is, is standing out as an introvert. So college students, you know, whether we, we can talk about the networking side or when they're on an interview, what are some tips that you would, would give recent graduates um, that are introverted to kind of start networking? Um, I will say as you're going into job scenarios, pay really close attention. I think that from a biological standpoint, and there's a whole bunch of neuroscience involved with introversion that I won't go into here. I write a little bit about it in the book. There are several other books that cover it far better than I ever could, but the short form of that is you are very well wired to pay attention, and that's not something that everybody has, especially in the type of society we have with constant notifications and always being on phones and things like that. You are wired to pay attention in a way that other people aren't. Use that to your advantage. When you're in conversations and somebody says something that kind of ticks you off as being important to them, remember that when you talk to them again. Um, I, for one, am really, really good about writing thank you cards for things and keeping really good written correspondence. So when I have those conversations where I talk to somebody who's interested in something specific, I'll remember that and write about it in a thank you note or in a follow-up email or things like that. And people notice. I've had students, actually, that I've interviewed with when I've gone for jobs that have told me after I've been hired, and it's been helpful to kind of know that as well, that they said when they were asked who they wanted to pick, they picked me because I responded to them and remembered what they said. So knowing the people that are important in the decision making and being able to recall those details that you're, again, wired to do, and then using your ability to express yourself well in writing, which is another thing that introverts tend to be very good at, is being good at corresponding in asynchronous environments. So emails, um, thank you cards, and other kinds of written correspondence, things where you have time to think before responding those are really good, strong environments. So make sure you're putting forth your best self when you're given the time to do that. And that can be really helpful as well. I love that tip. So recall the details and use your, your listening and kind of patience to really you know, listen to what's being said in that conversation or that interview. Mm -hmm. um, so what about when it comes to, you know, a lot of these places are big on culture and fit lately. And you said in your book, the interview part of it where it's like a lot of times extroverts might have the advantage and, and that's my that might be what the employers are looking for where introverts, you know, when they get when they get shown like I you know they have to be on campus or at an employer for four, eight or four or eight hours and it's a very scheduled, rigorous interview process. Um, introverts may not succeed as much. What tips do you have for that situation? So if I'm a recent graduate and I get you know scheduled for a half day interview at a company, do you have any mm -hmm. tips for um, again, like I talked about with being on the job as far as meetings are concerned, as soon as you can get an agenda as far as what your day is going to look like, that way, even if it's not something where you're going to have a whole lot of time to yourself, you can prepare yourself for what that day is going to look like. Because sometimes the preparation can be just as important as having those extra breaks. And when you do get breaks, take them to your advantage. Even if it's like two or three minutes to go to the bathroom, just take that time to very fully and intentionally collect yourself because you'd be surprised what it can do even that short amount of time. Um, I think doing as much research as you can in advance, knowing a lot about the company or environment you're going to be going into, finding opportunities to ask questions about what types of current events they're dealing with, looking at the news to kind of see what things that they might be looking at. Again, um, being good at focusing for long periods and being better inclined to do a lot of research, you have an advantage where you can go in with a lot of information that they might not expect you to have and more extroverted people may not necessarily look at. So being able to be attentive to those sorts of things will put you in a place where not all applicants are going to go into. So doing the extra legwork and being prepared to talk about some things that they might not expect you to ask about. That's great advice. So I think that question was geared towards maybe people or recent graduates that have, that have gotten an interview or have gotten a second chance mm -hmm. uh, second round interview. What about before they even get to where we've just been talking about? So you know, maybe uh, they're graduating college right now or they're a junior becoming a senior. Are there ways that they can start standing out now? So maybe they don't have an interview lined up or maybe they just did an internship. Um, how can they stand out now? And whether that's through some of the tips you've talked about or whether that's through online or in person or, or places to check out, what would you suggest? Well, I would say that we are at a great time right now where social media is concerned and that a lot of brands and a lot of companies that you may be looking to work at have online presence and they want to talk to people. 
So I think particularly because some of that correspondence can be asynchronous, that again is right in the wheelhouse of introverts. So reach out to those companies online. Show that you're interested. Um, do as much research as you can with them. See who it is that's working with them that's open to talking to people. Set up informational interviews. See what it is they're looking at. Do some of the research on things like Anchor 99U or other companies that um, might be doing spotlights on these companies and how they work. Show that you've done a lot of expansive research, not just what they're featuring of themselves, but what other people see about them as well. And again, I think that because we're in an age where so many people want it to be an experience where they want people interacting with them, take advantage of those opportunities because a lot of people pass it by, but they'll remember you and you'll be in a better place to kind of know what it is they're looking for if they're telling you. I'm glad you mentioned 99U and Inc. Those are two great resources that I think every college age or young adult should be checking out at least on a weekly basis. No uh, matter your field, there's information there that anyone can use. Yeah, and a lot of times you'll, you, you'll read a great blog post and it's just a matter of getting that person's Twitter handle or email and just complimenting on the article or connecting with them. Uh, but those are two great resources I would, if, you know, you definitely want to check out on a weekly basis. Definitely. Um, so let's, let's go this way. Um, is there advice that you would offer to college students or recent grads that maybe they're, they're a little bit lost or they're, they're still looking to, to find their niche um, and find out like what moves them? Um, I talked about it a little bit at the beginning. Um, I think that a lot of college culture has a tendency to say, pick a path. So you're picking a major or pick a job. And I think that there's a lot of advantage to exploring a little mm -hmm. bit wider than that. So just because you're in a major, let's say biology, for example, if you like to write or if you really like music, keep exploring those things because there are definite possibilities to have the two mesh together. There are just as many opportunities for the two to kind of come apart. And maybe you're the kind of person that works in the lab during the day but still gets to pursue music at night. So not closing off any of those opportunities for yourself. Um, there's a writer called Jeff Hayden that calls it being an and. So being okay with being someone that works in an office during the day and has the opportunity to write poetry and present poetry at night. Or somebody who maybe teaches during the day and is in an improv group on weekends. So being all right with having multiple interests and not deciding that just because you're grown up or an adult that you have to pick one. You don't necessarily have to pick as long as the main thing and the thing that you're getting paid for is getting done. The off time is yours. Keep yourself interesting because no one wants to be boring. Even adults, so keep exploring, keep doing fun things. Look at us. We're, we're perfect examples. And I, I think exactly. everybody, everybody, I'd say at least I've done about a dozen of these niche story interviews. I think at least half of them have said that piece of advice is uh, that boutique career, or go do something that you love on the weekends or, or write that blog post late at night. Um, there's other ways to get your name out there rather than between 9 and 5 o'clock. Exactly. And I know I get asked a lot because I do a lot of writing and other things. People are like, well, how do you find time for all of it or how do you find the energy? And if you're doing the right other stuff, that gives you energy to do the regular day-to-day -day thing. So I can come home and write till 11 o'clock or midnight, but then that next day, being fired up about that makes me better when I go into the office. So if nothing else, it gives you the energy to do what you're supposed to be doing. Exactly. It'll, it'll at least start jump-starting you know, where you want to go. Because and that's that's another big piece of the advice I share is, is it's not really uh, you don't have to figure it out at 22, 23 years old. I mean, there's ways to do it, but you, you know you may not figure it out until you're 30, 40, or uh, older than that. But there there's certain ways to kind of make your life enjoyable with what you're doing. Absolutely. So, all right, Amos. So we got about five minutes left. I like to do this with everybody. Is kind of a rapid fire round of questions. Okay. Nothing, hopefully. Um, I know you're into yoga and this and that, but the first question I'm going to ask you is, do you have a, a favorite gluten-free like baking recipe or like a blog or website that you check out for recipes like that? Hmm. Um, there is a girl named Kylie that runs a blog and Instagram account called I'm going to eat that. And some of it's gluten-free, not all of it is, and most of it can be adapted pretty easily, but she's one that I've gone to for a lot of recipes. Um, and one of my favorite recipes, not from her, but just the easiest one when I started gluten-free baking, which is a heinously difficult process, and if you don't have to do it, don't. It's ridiculous. Um, but there is a flourless peanut butter cookie that I really like, 
you can add oatmeal to it, and you can add chocolate chips or M&Ms. It's really versatile, so I like that because it's got a lot of good stuff in it, and you can't really tell if there's not gluten in it. I'll have, I'll have to check that out. I'll, I would definitely add the chocolate chips to it. I'm a huge <laughs> sweet tooth. <laughs> it makes a world of difference. Yes. Uh, what is your favorite app currently on your phone? Ooh, favorite app. You know what? I'm going to look because I thought about this one, and I don't know that I had a definitive answer. I will say, hmm. I really like GroupMe because it gives me the opportunity to have um, contained conversations with some groups that I'm working on. So I have a few conference committees that I work on, and it gives us a place to have everything in one place. So even if we're doing things like Google Hangouts and this, like we can have different side conversations all at one time, and then it keeps everything. So I actually had a one that I did with students a couple of years ago, and a group of those students just graduated. So we all got back on and talked to each other and everything. So it's got a good history to it and you can keep everything and just kind of go back to things if you like. So it's a cool time capsule as well. It's a great, great explanation of it. I would totally agree. Um, what would you tell your 22-year-old self? I'd probably tell her to relax. She looked she was pretty uptight, as I recall. Um, <laughs> I think that when I was 22, and I graduated college early, I actually graduated when I was 20, so I think there was a lot of the career advice that I didn't get because I left before it was time to get it. Um, so a lot of the concept of being an and and being able to have fun at work wasn't in there for me yet. So I think that I would have told 22-year-old me, you can have fun and have a job. Both of those things are possible. And I think that she needed to hear it. But I got it now, so we're good. <laughs> awesome. That's good to hear. Uh, two more questions. If you could make one thing talk, what would it be? Hmm. My keys because I don't have a dedicated place for them and they're lost all the time, so I think if I could shout out and they could shout back, that would make a world of difference. Um, my roommate is actually, I can see him from here, and he's nodding because he knows I lose my keys a lot, so we have verification. That is a true thing. you got to get that tile thing that you put on your keys and all the things that you lose. Then that'll be your favorite app. <laughs> there we go. Yes, so once I get that, then I'll have a new answer to that question. There you go. Um, and then the last thing, um, what is your niche? It's going to sound kind of cliche, but I feel like part of my niche is helping other people find theirs. I think that a lot of the reason that I wrote the book to begin with was because a lot of my friends and colleagues had been asking questions about how to help introverts in their lives, be it their coworkers, their students, themselves. And I think that the biggest reason that I wrote it was to be able to answer those questions in a way that was accessible to as many people as possible. So. That would be my answer. I think that my niche is helping others find their niche. I love it. Well, you've, you've definitely been a huge uh, supporter of the niche movement, written some amazing blog articles. I think you have about four or five now. I would highly recommend anybody watching this, whether you're watching it live or in the future, to go check a few of them out on our blog. Um, but again, Amy, this, this interview has been a great. And just to kind of wrap it all together, is it's, we, we've, we've realized that it's okay to be introverted, uh, mm -hmm. that basically that we actually, the superpower, you know, I'm introverted a little bit too, is that you actually have the ability to really listen to details and use them for a future use. And whether that's putting in your memory or writing something down or putting in an email, I think that's one great tip, right? That's what we covered? Definitely. And then uh, is, is being able to take breaks and kind of being able to kind of predict what your day might look like. So whether that's an interview or basically uh, your work day or finding that downtime where you can go work alone is, is really kind of being able to recharge the battery, so to speak. Yep, that's a big one. Uh, and any anything else? Any last tips or anything else you want to throw out to the audience? Hmm. I don't know. I think I would definitely just reiterate the keep on exploring part because I think you never really know what you're going to find that you really like. And I think the only way that you ever close yourself off to that opportunity is if you stop looking. So keep looking for it. Keep paying attention to things that strike your fancy, that you find interesting, that you might be able to have a mark on and get out there and do them. Even if they're not your job, you can still play a role in it. Awesome. Great way to close it. So anybody that wants to learn more about your book or introverts or standing out, um, how can they contact you, Anna? What's the best way? So my Twitter handle is at the bottom here. I answer questions. I'm on it all the time. Um, I think that would probably be a runner-up for my favorite app just because I use it the most. Um, 
On there is also a link to my blog and website, which is amamarfo.com. Um, there's a page on there just for the book. Um, there's also my blog on there as well as several other ways on how to contact me. And I can answer pretty much any questions you might have. I'm always open to talking to people and helping out. Great. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Emma. And to let the audience know, we've been doing uh, pretty much one of these once a month. Uh, this is our fourth interview so far of the year, 2014. In June, uh, we'll be interviewing Melanie Feldman, Feldman and Josh Siva. They are the founders and authors of Bold Job Book. I connected with these guys in the last month, and they've been phenomenal to talk with, and we're going to jump on, talk about their book, uh, and it's basically their book is being bold, how to stand out, get jobs, get noticed, and instead of you know basically applying to 20 or 30 jobs, how to really focus on five, five jobs and actually get some interviews. So they're young, they're actually 25 years old, and they have a great name for themselves so far. So we're going to be interview, interviewing those two in June. And right now we're looking for somebody to interview in July. So if anybody out there wants to email me, kevin at the niche movement com. feel free to email me a suggestion or somebody you know, or maybe it's yourself. I would love to get on here and talk about a few different things on how we can help young adults find their niche and find something that they love doing. Aside from that, that's going to wrap up our interview with Emma. And again, thank you so much for joining us, Emma. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Bye-bye.